Now, here's your host, Rob Vicano. And welcome back. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And to find out about the programming we have available for you on the Exxon Broadcast Network 24 7 365, visit www.xzbn.net. And for the programming we have, on the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV, visit www.simultv.com. Our guest this hour is a young lady that's going to be talking to us who is a trained psychic and a spiritual medium. Now, uh, Nancy, how do you pronounce your family name? Uh, nobody ever gets it right. So it's technically Duterte, but nobody gets that. So it's going to end up being Duterte, Duterte. Duterte, or I also answer to two turtles if all else fails. All right, so if I, I call you Nancy du, du Tetre, am I right? Yes, that's actually quite good. Well, that's not too bad for a French guy. <laughs> so, so, yes, so, your, so your name means Nancy of the Head? No, uh, that, that would be uh, de la Tete. This is du Tetre, which means from the small hill. Oh, the small hill. All right, so, yeah. so tell us a little bit about yourself. Where should I start? Well, what, little, what, what small hill did you come from? Uh, I didn't, but my husband did. My husband is uh, French. Right. And uh, actually, I've become French in, in the years, so um, uh, I didn't come from a small hill. I came from, I've lived all over the United States. I've lived in England, France, and Germany. Wow. Uh, we, we moved a lot when I was a kid. And I became a businesswoman, then became an attorney practicing in, in New York for close to a decade. I practiced securities litigation. Right. And then I did this kind of strange detour in my life. And I uh, started to write a book about what I thought was going to be the psychology of intuition. Mm -hmm. And when I started to look through the literature of all the psychologists and psychiatrists, they didn't want to deal with intuition, and they were calling it things like empathy or resonant empathy or transference or counter-transference. In other words, I know what those things are, and none of them are intuition. And so they didn't want to deal with intuition, uh, so I studied a bunch of neuroscience. I thought maybe they would have the answers. They didn't want to deal with it. Wow. And, and then I sort of went and I tried to find anybody who knew something about it, and that's what led me to psychics, psychic detectives, mediums, medical intuitives, mm -hmm. um, uh, military programs, um, just all kinds of stuff, artists, poker players, you name it. And I realized at a certain point that if I was going to write about this thing called intuition, that I had to understand it on a very basic experiential level mm -hmm. so i trained it and i trained as a psychic detective for about 10 years and uh that's what i do i also trained uh in military style remote viewing techniques so i'm trained in several different types of remote viewing and i've also developed my own type of remote viewing that i call tsp now who did you study remote viewing with uh, front with the military I studied with uh, Lynn Buchanan, and my mentor was Ingo Swan. Okay. Why did you decide to become a psychic? Um, well, I didn't decide to. In fact, I was fighting it the whole way because, you know, it, I grew up uh, in a very academic family, very left-brained. Nobody believed in that stuff. I certainly didn't believe in it. And um, so I didn't decide to be that way. I... Uh, I'm I'm just a curious person. I like learning, you know, uh, about different people and, and different ways of thinking. So sure. I realized at a certain point when I was sort of involved in these training things that I was 
pretty good at it. Um, and people would tell me that, and I would laugh at them because I thought it was ridiculous. And at a certain point, I realized, well, uh, it's time to either accept this. You know, I'd be I'd be silly not to accept it. I have enough proof already. And and when you're an attorney, you kind of like proof. You like evidence. But how do you go from being an attorney to being a psychic and a remote viewer? Uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, not too many people take that pathway. Um, it, it takes, it's really hard to explain. When you have to change the way that you look at everything mm -hmm. and the way that you process all types of thinking, um, it takes a lot of courage. And my biggest issue was always uh, making a fool of myself because I don't like that. Um, and I particularly, you know, as somebody who uh, I, I'm very analytic. And so when you're analytic, you can always kind of reverse engineer your thinking. Mm -hmm. You can take it back and say, well, the reason why I got there was because of this, 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 and it's all logical. It all makes sense. And you can prove it to other people. When you get into the psychic realm, you can't prove anything. There is no way to reverse engineer this because there is no logic because you're not dealing with a linear sequential type of thinking. Um, the only way that you can prove it is by feedback. So feedback, particularly in, in different types of remote viewing, becomes really important. And that's how you could sort of say to yourself, well, okay, I'm on the right track, I get it, and I, I'm not a complete fool. How but would it's hard. How would you describe psychic intuition? I describe, well, let me put it this way. I describe intuition on a kind of a sliding scale. Okay. Um, because I think a lot of times what people have done is they've separated out intuition that we all kind of know and we all get it mm -hmm. from this crazy psychic stuff. And for me, from what I've learned... Um, it's all on the same sliding scale, but you have different ratios of two different components, two different variables, um, conscious to unconscious awareness of, say, let's say, the facts or the situation, and then rational to irrational thoughts. So if you start on the really conservative side, you have educated guesses, which we all get, and pretty much even, you know, scientists and business people, and uh, they all understand that. Educated guesses, you're just missing maybe a link or two in, your, in, in, in being absolutely 100% certain about something. You get into the kind of the middle of this sliding scale of intuition, and you get into the realm of things that are like gut feelings and hunches. Uh, it's very, it, it, the emotions start to have a certain weight in your understanding about life right and you're missing more data and it's more unconscious all right and then finally you get out to the 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 uh the most liberal end let's call it uh which is the psychic realm and in that realm you're dealing with sometimes it's completely irrational and sometimes it's completely not within your conscious awareness and and that's tough. I mean, if if you're a rational thinker, that is really hard to go there. So would it be fair to say you had to reinvent yourself? Totally. Absolutely. I've got about a minute and a half before I have to go to my first break. What was the biggest change in your life when you decided to, if you'll excuse the expression, come out of the closet with your... <laughs> <laughs> with your with your desires to be part of the paranormal world and a psychic. What was the thing that changed the most? Yeah. Uh, I think I really started believing in myself. Um, I think for as much as you can go around the world mm -hmm. and, and think that you trust yourself, you don't trust yourself until you are completely flying blind. And what it enabled me to do was to become a better lawyer, a better human being. I'm better in psychology. I'm better in a whole lot of things because it put me on what I call this super highway of information. Nancy, please stand by. You and I have to take our first break. Exonation, our guest this hour is Nancy de Tertre. 
And uh, if you'd like to get more information about Sandy, visit her website, www.theskepticalpsychic.com. And Nancy and I will be back. Oh, there. I love that song. Thanks, Greg. Nancy and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studio in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, you can always get the current edition of the X-Chronicles newspaper with our compliments that is read around the world at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Nancy Dutetre is our special guest. She is the Skeptical Psychic. And, and why are you known as the Skeptical Psychic? Well, it's not obvious yet. No. Nope. <laughs> uh, skeptical because when you start out on the other side of the fence, you don't believe, mm -hmm. you never had any experience with this kind of stuff, and you kind of don't want to go there because you don't really trust it or you're nervous about it. Right. Yeah, you're skeptical. But it's a it's a good kind. It's not the uh, what I call the um, religious uh, skeptics, and by that I mean zealots. I mean people who their go-to primary position is, I don't believe, therefore it doesn't exist. Well, you know, that's, that's their right to believe that way, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, coming from that other side of the fence, mm -hmm. I have a huge amount of compassion for people who don't get it. I spend a lot of my time trying to explain how and why this works. And I, in fact, I've written a book called Psychic Intuition, mm -hmm. which explains in terms of neuroscience, psychology, and linguistics, how we all start out with these abilities, why we all lose them, or most of us lose them, and how we can get them back again. Because I'm, I'm just a trained person. I, I can so, under, I understand I understand your your voyage that you took in getting to the conclusions that you have gotten to, yeah. but if it is so legitimate, how come it isn't a recognized part of the scientific psyche that we people have? Oh yeah, well that's for exactly the reason that I've been talking about, which is your typical left-brained people, your your analytic, intellectual, scientific, whatever people. Mm -hmm. They have only learned how to process thinking in one particular way, which is very sequential. It's linear. Right. We get that way because we start out learning language. Okay, language but is let literally me, let me takes ask, that kind of time. Let so me ask, they don't get it. Let me ask you this then. If we yeah. are all born with it, why doesn't it all stay with us? Because we get trained out of it. Because our brains start to... In most people, the left hemisphere is dominant. Okay. Okay. Uh, so your right hemisphere, which is your holistic side, your non-analytic side, and mm -hmm. tends to be your more psychic data side, gets wiped out. And they've done studies. You know, they, they for a long time did uh, split brain studies. Mm -hmm. And they showed that if the, for example, the left brain was shown an item, let's say a fabric with a particular color, uh, it and let's say it's a green fabric, but they use the word blue, and they put the word blue underneath, and only your, your left hemisphere sees it, it will say, oh, that's a blue item. Mm -hmm. If it's shown to the right hemisphere and does not have a word attached to it, it'll say green. Okay. We have disagreements inside our brain all the time, but because the left hemisphere, which is also where most of our language is located, um, it dominates. So that part of our entire reality literally, and I mean literally, disappears. Then how come other, other things that we are born with are not wiped out? For example... Oh, they are. Well, wait, they a, are. Sec, wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec, like wait a sec, wait, wait a sec, hold on here. What about talking? What about walking? What about cognizant um, reactions that we have? Why is it only the psychic that is wiped out and not these other... 
uh, traits that we're born with? No, there are, people have suggested, uh, for example, that we're all born with perfect pitch mm-hmm. and it gets wiped out. Uh, we're born with certain abilities to uh, learn other languages. Most of these abilities get wiped out between roughly the ages of three and six. And they get wiped out because our language becomes dominant. Um, so we, the way that I have explained this is that instead of experiencing the world uh-huh. as if everything is unique and singular, you know, and you have no way to compare it to anything, we, what we start to do is we start to use metaphors. We start, everything becomes relative to something else. Okay, so everything then becomes an abstract thought. So we, we lose our, our ability to experience the world literally, like a baby. Okay, babies just experience everything like it's the first time ever. They have no way to compare it to anything. And a lot of this psychic data that we get comes into our, our bodies and into our brains as... Um, we can't identify it. We've never, we don't have anything to compare it to. It comes in as nonsense. Mm-hmm. And if with our very developed linguistic brains, we can't compare the psychic data to anything, it, it disappears from our, our reality. Then how come some people retain it? Um, I think some people are encouraged to retain it you know, the way that their families are, are, bring them up, you know, and they acknowledge mm-hmm. certain things, and in other families they don't. Um, were you I encu- think it has... Were you yeah, en- go ahead. Were you encouraged? Oh, absolutely not. No, 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 no. I come from a very academic family. Oh, okay. Uh, my, my father was uh, a scientist, mm-hmm. internationally recognized scientist, and uh, my mother comes from a very academic family. Okay. So, no. Uh Uh-uh, this stuff didn't exist. Did you, looking back as a child, have any psychic experiences? You know, I think I maybe had two that I can remember. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of them, I I recall, I think I was about, I must have been about 13 years old or so, and I was over to a friend's house, and we were talking about ghosts, you know, how, like, teenage, young teenage kids talk about ghosts. Ooh, that's, you know so much fun and we got called down for dinner we go into their um uh my friend it was her her name was beth it was uh they were all eating dinner watching tv and i wasn't allowed to watch tv at that time in my life and so i really didn't know what was on or didn't know what to expect but there was a this woman who comes out on the tv uh she she, i don't know she i think she was holding a platter or something and I knew immediately what she was about to say. And I, I said what she was about to say, and then she said it. And because even at that age, I was kind of, you know, I was an analytical type of kid. So I what, Was it the lady? I really, what was, I, I'm, I'm a little confused here. Was it the lady on TV that you knew what was going to say, or the lady in the house? The lady, or, the lady on TV. How do you explain that? Well, that's what I was trying to figure out when I was 13. But as, as, I, but as a so psychic here, now. So I said to my friend, I said, oh, you know, in my head, because I, I, I asked myself, how, did, how could you know something that you can't know? So in my head, I had heard her father's voice saying what this woman was going to say. And so I said to my little friend, Beth, mm-hmm. I said, well, did your, was, did your father say that? Is that? Could I have, you know, somehow... And she said, well, actually, I think he was, but it was uh, long before you came over to the house. He was talking about that particular show, and he had made some comment about whatever that, you know, the, this woman on the TV was saying. It, it, it's a stupid and complex little story, and, and it didn't make any sense to me. All I remember is think, I was thinking, there's no way in, in my reality that would have allowed me to have that information and that was so confusing hmm. to me, I stuffed it in the, uh, you know, does not compute box in my brain. And I left it there. Fascinating. I then, I mean, and over the, then I had a, a mediumship type experience, I had a, which I couldn't explain either. 
Didn't know what to do with that. Stuffed it in the same little place in my brain and forgot about it. But other than that, no. I mean, I just wasn't one of those kids who grew up, you know, seeing spirits and, mm-hmm. and predicting and doing all that kind of stuff. But it's all trainable. And I know it's trainable. I understand that you have an interest in ufology and aliens. I do. How That's that, also new. <laughs> how did that come about? I didn't about? start out with that one either. How did that come about? Uh, how did that come about? Well, um, I would say that the really important, or the, 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 the time when I finally said to myself, well, there's no getting around this one, was when I went to a, uh, a local movie theater here in New Jersey. And I went with my daughter, who mm-hmm. was, I don't know, she must have been about, I don't know, 19 years old, I guess. And uh, we saw the we saw the movie. Uh, it was Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, which is all about going backwards in time, by the way. And uh, we got out of the movie, and there was I, nobody in the movie theater. I've never seen that before. Nobody. Maybe one employee, but I even, I'm not so sure about that. We, but there were no customers. We walked out into this parking lot, into a big, it's a big shopping mall. It's a big, flat, open area. And we're going to the car, and my daughter pointed up in the sky, and she said, what's that? And she, I look up, and about 500, 2,000 feet up in the air, there's a mass of about 20 to 30 uh, orange lights. And we all know. Nobody, I mean, airplanes are using white, blue, or red. There's Nobody uses orange. So that was weird. So I thought, well, maybe somebody is, like, bouncing lights from somewhere on the ground, and they're bouncing off of clouds and reflecting. But there was no cloud cover, and there were no beams of light being bounced off of anything. And the closer we looked at this, the more you could make out it was a boomerang-shaped craft. It was the size of a football field. And it was sitting there doing nothing. All right, we're going to have a bit of a cliffhanger here. I have to take my news break at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, our guest this hour is Nancy de Tetra. I hope I'm saying that right. And yeah. Nancy and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exo from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to visit Nancy online, her website is theskepticalpsychic.com. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the Exo. Don't go away. Back explanation. Nancy de Tertre is our special guest, and she is a trained psychic and spiritual medium. She wasn't born that way, and if she was, she uh, doesn't remember it. She believes we all have the capability of tuning into the supernatural once we unlearn our logical processes and learn to trust the profoundly irrational processes of our mind. She loves evidence of the supernatural or paranormal, but doesn't get stuck on the concept. Learning how to trust the information that comes in a non-verbal, disorganized, fragmented fashion is not easy. You have to trust your insight. Otherwise, this kind of data is quickly dismissed by the brain. But you must then try to verify your information. Now, this means that you must uh, exist in a very uncomfortable mental place of being both a believer and a skeptic at the same time. This process will lead you to the truth. Nancy spent a lifetime attempting to master this strange balancing act. Her website is theskepticalpsychic.com. And before we went to the news break, Nancy, you were telling us about the you and your daughter went to see a Woody Allen movie. It was very strange. There were very few people in the theater. You walk out into the parking lot, look up. Uh, your daughter looks up, points at a very strange object in the sky, orange lights, later identified as a boomerang-shaped object. So take it from there. Yeah, and my daughter started to say, uh, let's go, let's go, let's get out of here. Mm-hmm. And she she really freaked out when she saw it. And I said, no, I, I, I have to figure out what this thing is. What does it do? What the heck is it? And eventually, a uh, 
very large white luminescent orb sort of telescoped open off of the one of these the wings of this boomerang shaped football field sized craft and uh it detached it started moving around in this sort of curlicue fashion like it was looking for something mm-hmm. it went behind the craft came back over the top redocked and then disappeared in sort of a a blink and uh at some point the craft either cloaked or dematerialized in three phases starting with the tips of the these the the wings or i guess you would call them the boomerang um and then the center and the very center and poof it was gone and and then oh so the important part is after that we went back we didn't discuss it i said how about to my daughter i said how about we try and draw what we both saw before we tell each other so we both in color drew what we saw it was identical and uh for the next year and a half we began to see receive extremely strange uh telephone call interruptions and i believe they were aliens contacting us uh after that event why you Oh, I have no idea, and frankly, I don't think it has too much to do with me at all. Um, I I think that some people, well, no, I, I'm going to clarify that. Some people do see these uh, craft, and mm-hmm. some, some people can be looking directly at them, and they don't see them at all. So, yes, in that sense, okay, may, maybe, because I've trained myself now to see things that maybe my left brain wouldn't be able to identify. What happens if your but, left? What happens if your right brain is wrong? Um, well, your left brain can be wrong too. I mean, we can be wrong all the time. I, I understand that, but I just asked you what happens if your right brain is wrong. Uh, well, then what happens? I mean, uh, all I know is that uh, it was confirmed by my daughter. She was also a witness. Okay. We both drew the same thing, uh-huh. which would tend to confirm that we both saw the same thing, experienced it. And then we both got the same telephone uh, interruptions. Uh, didn't matter whether you know what combination of landlines or cell phones or whatever we were using. Mm-hmm. And eventually, uh, some of her friends heard it, and some of my friends and clients heard it. What kind of interceptions so, were they? Um, what would happen is we'd be having a normal conversation. All of a sudden, there would be a very weird. Uh, deep electronic male sounding voice that would uh, start talking and as soon as it started talking we couldn't hear each other but we could both hear it Mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know what language it was speaking it sounded like it was coming through huge amounts of uh, like waves wave distortion Um, it it would speak and when it was done speaking one time it did say my daughter's name by the way that was the only recognizable thing Uh, it would stop and then it would disconnect both of us simultaneously, and then neither one of us would be able to call back the other for usually five or ten minutes. And as I said, that went on for a year and a half. Now, where was it you saw this UFO? The in the well, parking lot. the craziest lot. thing. I mean, uh, the New Jersey, United States, okay. uh, five minutes from my house. All I mean, right. Is it is that is it a major city? At what time no, was it? No, 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 not at all. I well, mean, I, I, this is uh, roughly, say, a half-hour drive outside of New York City. Okay, and uh, what time of night was it? It was 11.45 p.m. Were there any other reports of UFOs made to the authorities or to the media that night? Well, my daughter, when we got back, she said, well, we have to, we have to call the police and report mm-hmm. this. So she picked up the phone, and I said, you know, Celine, maybe put the phone down for a sec. Let's let's consider this one carefully. I said, what exactly are you going to tell them? And she thought about it. She didn't know what she was going to tell them. I said, well, how about this? How about you ask them, if you're insisting on calling them, ask them if anybody's reported seeing anything strange in the sky tonight, so, which she did. And, of course, nobody had, even though it's right on a, it's, uh, it's on a highway. So you would think somebody would have seen something. Uh, I then, for the first time in my life, started... Uh, Going through, I realized that they're uh, reporting uh, sites and organizations for UFOs, which I had no clue because I wasn't into this. And uh, I started, I did see that there had been some reports in a neighboring town 
uh, that night, roughly that period of time, where they had seen some kind of a craft, nothing like what we saw, though, uh, coming in in our direction. Hmm. The uh, the area where the where the sighting was made by you and your daughter was it in a high air traffic control area, a controlled area? No, not really. No, um, there there no. There you have uh, Newark Airport. Newark Airport is roughly I don't know a half hour away. Right, that's quite. A but distance, their right? planes don't generally fly over our area. There's a couple of small airports, but mm-hmm. nothing significant. How did that sighting change your life? Oh, well, if all of a sudden uh, you realize there's a possibility of uh, <laughs> non-human intelligent species and um, that they're interacting with us and they're interacting intelligently and have the capability to cut into phone conversations, potentially read your mind, um, uh, get into your dreams, mm-hmm. Uh, transact, you know, with you, they can change your reality. Uh, it, it, so, so uh, overnight, virtually, I mean, everything changes. Y- it expands your entire concept of what is. I understand you've written a book, How to Talk to an Alien. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, and, well, that sort of, uh, that grew out of my interest in being contacted that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got interested in trying to figure out, uh, you know, who is trying to communicate with us and what are the various types of ways in which non-humans, intelligences, can communicate. And so I researched it a lot, and I kind of discovered that uh, there are probably many different species. They are communicating not only in human languages, but in alien languages, and not just in this sort of sequential language that we all deal in, but they also communicate in very um, uh, nonverbal, sometimes telepathic ways. So it's kind of, it's it's a huge area, and I was shocked because hardly anybody had ever talked about this before. I only found one one serious researcher in the field. And who was that? Uh, His name was, he was a psychiatrist from the state of Delaware. His name was Dr. Mario Pasaglini, uh, and he had basically gathered, I don't know, maybe a, a hundred or so different writing samples mm-hmm. from contactees, and he had broken down the different types of writing samples into three different categories, what he called uh, dot and line, cursive or script style, and geometric style of, of for the different types of writing or alphabets that they have. And I found that to be a really useful kind of a a guideline, a good starting point, although I think that there are more types than that. So what message do you think the aliens are trying to give you? Depends who you talk to. I'm asking you. Uh, (laughs) uh, you've You've got, I think, some that are trying to the most obvious is save the environment or uh, save the world from uh, destruction of humans by humans. Save the world from tearing certain dimensional fabrics. Um, uh, humans need to start understanding, you know, mm-hmm. their own violent t- tendencies. I, I understand you know, these are wonderful messages, but why don't they, the aliens give these messages to the people who can actually make these changes happen, the people in power, the people in government, the leaders of yeah, churches? I, I think, you know, that that was probably attempted. Um, they say that that was attempted, certainly in, in the U.S. with, with uh, Eisenhower, who may have cut some deals. Oh, with you're talking some... about the MJ-12 papers here. Well... Okay, listen, we've got to take a break. We'll be right back. Sure. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Our guest this hour is Nancy Duterte and uh, her website, theskepticalpsychic.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon. Don't go away.
Nancy, uh, are you finding uh, commonalities across the board in the languages, the alien languages that you've studied? What I Yes, there are some. Uh, but I have to tell you, I am extremely frustrated not to find more. Um, and I, because that sort of bothers my whole sense of, well, you know, how many groups are out there that are communicating in the same language versus are, it, it, does this stem from the imagination of the, the human? Mm-hmm. And so it bugs me when I can't find more commonalities in the language. But yes, I would say uh, w- what I did talk about in, in my book, How to Talk to an Alien, is I talked about four different cases where I found matches uh, f- from, uh, let's see, it was an American American guy in Florida, British um, woman, a couple of Japanese kids, and there was, oh, and a Brazilian man. Okay, so there are people mm-hmm. all over the world, different time periods when they got this particular type of writing. It was the, uh, the dot and line style of writing, um, and they do seem to be certain commonalities in it. The problem is you're not necessarily dealing with, you know, like a uh, Latin alphabet, you know, or 26 letters sure. or anything like that. And sometimes you, uh, I've seen certain types of writing, for example, that tend to look more like the sort of ideograms that you might find in, uh, like, the Chinese uh, characters and that kind of thing. So it, it's been difficult. In your opinion, is there a connection between the communications that you receive and others receive in the crop circles? I think that there are, they are condensed ideograms. That's my sense. I, I interviewed a guy years ago mm-hmm. who claimed to be one of the secret crop circle makers uh, in England. And he said that he had, you know, was sort of wide-eyed and idealistic when he first heard about, you know, these crop circles. He went and he found this group of, I think he said it was roughly... 60 people at the time who were making them and got sort of disillusioned until he started to realize that even among this group of human crop circle makers that uh, sometimes one person would get an idea for a design only to discover that one or two other people had the identical idea and were building them on the same fields at the same time or they started seeing, you know, the the flying orbs of of uh, different colored lights over the crop circles. So he began to realize there's something going on that's beyond simply what he and his buddies were doing. Um, so I I think that it's it's so much connected in with the concept of of human collective consciousness and tapping that as well as expressing things through symbols that we can somehow collectively create and understand. I don't, I don't know if that's too complicated, but that's what I feel. Have, have you found that being a psychic detective, spiritual medium, paranormal investigator, and remote viewer has been of any asset to you in trying to decipher alien communications? Yeah, and, and what I think is that they are uh, all related, which I never understood. You know, I thought when I first started this voyage, mm-hmm. uh, I thought that, okay, psychics, you know, that to be psychic is one thing. And then I realized psychic is related to paranormal events and dealing with spirits and other types of non-human entities. And I had no idea that any of that was related to UFOs or to alien entities. But it is. And the more that you are capable of... Um, communicating in in those realms mm-hmm. the, the more information you can get so yeah they are related why do why in your opinion don't these visitors just land and get it over with and and prove their point once and for all to each and every one of us instead of a select few um well people have been asking that for a long time although they did fly over the white house um allegedly uh, <laughs> what's that i said allegedly well, yeah, except they're photos of them. Well, so. the, the, nobody can prove they are UFOs. Well, I mean, what is proof of anything? Uh, let me see. Uh, if we're talking about Roswell, uh, a crashed UFO would be kind of neat, or a, really a dead alien if we're talking about Bigfoot, a cadaver of a Bigfoot, and the list goes on and on and on. 
so so you're talking about being able to touch something physical and tangible, and that makes it real to you. As an ex-police detective, yes. Okay. I wrote my entire book, Psychic Intuition, mm -hmm. which explains the difference between uh, our concept of reality and perceptions. Perceptions are can be highly, highly manipulated so that uh, all of us are... Uh, experience hallucinations. In fact, 39% of the world experiences very obvious hallucinations, you know. Um, but in any, any one of the five senses, the mm -hmm. basic senses, you can trick the brain into believing that something has happened when it absolutely has not happened. So how do we so know these paranormal events aren't part of that 39% of the hallucination ratio? Well, I think what you try and do is you try to get cross-collaboration, mm -hmm. either with somebody else or with uh, two or more of your senses. I think that's the best way to do it. Once again, I, I have a hard time understanding the logic behind a lot of these sightings and a lot of these experiencers when there is, you know, millions of people, billions of people on this planet who have not seen or experienced anything that is classified within the paranormal or in 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 the genre of ufology and yet there are millions who have right uh, how, what what part does the media play in the in the desire for people to see ufos or to experience a paranormal experience is there something in our social structuring right now that people want excitement and they're looking outside of the realm of reality for this excitement People are always going to look outside the realm of reality for excitement. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. The problem is that if you're if you're suggesting that people are only you know saying they're seeing these things because of what they're watching on TV, mm -hmm. you know there have been sightings going back through the millennia. Mm -hmm. I mean, I talk about a case that I think was in 15th century China of a guy getting abducted, having being on the medical exam table basically. They fiddled around with his heart, put his heart back in, and suddenly he finds himself, you know, back on Earth. Um, there, so you don't you don't need a TV in order to be influenced to have these thoughts. No, but as as a lawyer, weren't you trained to deal in the facts? Yeah. So what is a fact? And I think you, you know I'm, I I do a lot of psychic detective work, so usually I'm I'm looking for uh, dead bodies, uh -huh. and. What I have discovered, because who would have thought that if you know Zippo about, you know, the whoever the, the victim was, mm -hmm. or the suspect, or anybody involved, or anything about it, who, who would think that you'd be able to get anything super specific, like uh, the name of a witness, like the color of shoes that were being worn by the victim, or the precise location on an island where it turns out it was the only place where the uh, uh, the police or law enforcement ever decided to excavate. I mean, there are things that end up being so bizarrely precise that you, you say to yourself, well, I know that that was impossible, sure. but but that's real. That is real. You just have to learn how to incorporate that into your concept of what is reality. It's a different way of connecting the dots. All right, I can understand that, and, and I'll give you the, the psychic detective part. But when it comes to extraterrestrials, aliens, I, I personally think that's a little too far on the edge to be even considered as part of rational thinking. Yeah. Well, I, listen, I, I probably would have agreed with you if I hadn't experienced that myself. Um, in fact, I think I even wrote in my book, Psychic Intuition, I said, you know, now that I've finally had the, I, I've been able to experience ghosts. Now I, I've been able to see them with my physical eyes, hear them with my physical ears, feel them with my skin, um, uh, and smell them. How do you okay? feel, how do you feel a ghost with your skin? Oh, because, uh, they can touch you in a whole variety of ways. Uh, the way that I've experienced them is, uh, and it's all done through cross uh, corroboration of, of your different senses. So it's, it's sort of a part of a package. But mm -hmm. um, the way that I've felt them is as uh, almost like a, a coolness or a cool breeze on my skin. But I have many friends who've been physically touched by them. They can feel the outlines of their 
the, uh, of a, I guess, an etheric body or whatever. Uh, they could feel warmth, temperature, texture, size, all kinds of things. But anyway, but, but I, what I wanted to say was that you, what I had said was, okay, now I finally understand what a mm-hmm. good ghost can be experienced as. So I believe in ghosts. I'm, I'm okay with that now. But I said I'd probably have to see an alien before I believe in one. I, and I said that straight out. And now, uh, you know, it's sort of be careful what you you wish for. But did, I've did, now I'm, I'm sorry. Had, I'm sorry. I, I I'm getting very short on time here. But yeah. just uh, just in a very few words, I thought you saw a UFO. You didn't see an alien. Absolutely correct. And the only thing that I have experienced in terms of an alien in my physical world of my with my physical ears yeah. was those telephone conversations all right nancy you and i have to say so long for tonight thank you for joining us i find Ooh. it rather amusing that you're a uh, what, what a what is this again craig uh psychic detective spiritual medium paranormal investigator remote viewer aliens communicate with you and you've uh, written a number of books you've I don't know. I I really can't buy into it. I really can't. Exxon Nation, tell me what you think. Send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com. I'm Rob McConnell. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Whatever you do, don't go away or get abducted or communicate with aliens or whatever it is that you might do after listening to this interview.